Hello, I'm Anne Deverson. The tapes that you're about to watch have been produced by Dawn Rowan, an experienced counsellor, therapist and teacher. I've known Dawn both personally and professionally for over 15 years and I've always found her work refreshingly different and successful. Dawn has developed her unique approach through working in the fields of domestic violence, incest and sexual assault. Her background has been as a school teacher, a social worker, community development officer, a university lecturer, and as a consultant for government and the private sector. And Dawn now works as a private therapist. These tapes are a practical guide to achieving happy, healthy, and successful relationships with members of your family, co-workers, and friends. And they're also an invaluable aid for professionals, in fact, for anyone who's trying to cope with life in the 90s. I think you'll gain a great deal from this series, The Missing Links. We're going to begin by looking at what constitutes healthy relationships. Now, if I take a circle to represent person A in any relationship. And this represents their life, their interests, their, their activities, hobbies, their um, community work, their extended family relationships and so on. And I take another circle to represent person B in any relationship. And this represents their life, interests, hobbies, activities, community work and so on. But a healthy relationship looks like that, where there is <clears throat> an overlap that allows for space for both of them to have their work, for instance, for both of them to have their community activity, sport, recreation, study, for both of them to have their relationship with their children, with their nuclear family, with their extended family and some of that together. And also allows for time and space for themselves. Now you can see that a healthy relationship then gets filled up very quickly. Uh, each of these other activities, areas of life, can support and fertilise and enrich the actual relationship. Now, a healthy relationship then has a broad base of support. There's lots of different things happening in this relationship that can enrich and can, can sustain the relationship. An unhealthy relationship looks like this, where the relationship begins to take over the life of both. And there's no space for yourself there's no space for work, there's no space for extracurricular activities, interests, hobbies, community activities, there's no space for family, there's only space for the relationship and so the other things begin to just sort of disappear, they sort of just drop off. This relationship is enmeshed, what's called enmeshed. It has a pretty narrow base of support here. There's not much that's going to sustain that relationship. It's important to note that you can become enmeshed not just with the relationship. That's one form of enmeshment. You can, in fact, become enmeshed with work. Then everything else gets excluded. And that is the position, then, of the workaholic. You can become enmeshed with a hobby or an interest or an activity so that some people get enmeshed with their computer as a hobby. They have no other relationship except the computer. Uh, you can become enmeshed with your motorbike. Can't have any social activities because I've got to be running around the place on the motorbike and polishing up the chrome and so on. It excludes everything else. This position can be the position of somebody who takes on an extreme position with an ideology, a political belief, a religious belief. The religious extremist 
is becoming enmeshed or has become enmeshed. One of the difficulties about that position is, of course, that in terms of a relationship, that is considered high romance in our culture. This is under the general heading of all I need is the air that I breathe and to love you and nothing else in life. And that is poised to fail. It's already mostly failed. From there, many people end up in this sort of relationship. It develops from there often to here rather than to go to, back into the direction of a healthy relationship. And what does this position mean? Here, person A in the relationship traps, isolates and controls person B. This barrier of person A prevents other people making contact, other ideas, you know, other, other events and activities happening. This person can't get past the barrier, which can be, the barrier can be physical, psychological, financial, social. But it has the impact of this person, person B, being trapped, isolated, controlled, very often in fear. And it can be fear of abuse, it can be physical abuse, it can be sexual abuse. Fear of abuse, but it can also be fear of humiliation, fear of rejection, fear of abandonment. So that there is fear involved. There is often exhaustion involved in these relationships and there is repetition. So person A says the same thing over and over and over again to person B. So they might be saying in a sort of a social entrapment, all your friends are dangerous, crazy lunatics and I don't want to have anything to do with them. You mustn't bring them home and if you do I'll behave so badly you'll never bring them back. Or in a social context they might be saying all your friends are laughing at you, they think you're crazy, stupid and inadequate. But the social, the message is socially you're on your own. You may not have friends. Um, this can be a physical barrier. People can be physically isolated uh, without um, access to a car, for instance. You can be physically isolated. You can be physically isolated living out, you know, on a farm somewhere and not being able to get in. You can physically isolate people by um, uh, various means of keeping them at home, like, for instance, with deadlocks. With some of the violent families I've dealt with, uh, people have actually been locked in inside the house with deadlocks. Physically, people can be isolated if the two people are working, where, you know, person A drives person B to work, rings them up at morning tea, picks them up for lunch, rings them up for afternoon tea and then drives them home. So the various means of physically isolating people. The psychological impact of it though acts as brainwashing. And what that means is that with the strategies of trapping, isolating, controlling, uh, keeping somebody f in fear, repeating the same thing over and over and over again, person B begins to believe whatever it is that person A tells them. So if person A says, you're fat, ugly, stupid, incompetent, insane, you're a hopeless mother, you can't cook, person B will begin to believe it. This is the position of the abusive relationship. You must be in that position in order to uh, be able to abuse somebody. It won't work here and may not work there. And we're talking about in these tapes the continuum of relationships from you know moderately um, you know unhappy you know few communication problems everyone feeling a bit niggly and you know etc and unhappy in the relationship right through to people who are experiencing extremely abusive relationships. The analysis applies across the spectrum. So in this position then, you must be, in order to be in an abusive relationship, 
trapped, isolated, and have your reality defined by per the person who traps you. Then the natural evolution from that is a complete split. If anything changes, it is most likely to be there, where there is a separation. It is unlikely to go back to here because the two people who stay in this relationship, the one who traps and the one who stays there being trapped, both stay in this relationship out of low self-esteem and a belief that if I don't stay here, if I haven't got this relationship, nobody else will have me. Both people are f fearful of rejection. There is low self-esteem inherently involved in this scenario. However, in the healthy relationship, both parties have a healthy self-esteem. They feel safe and comfortable about space and about having their partner enriched by other activities and inputs into the relationship. So the difference between the healthy and the abusive relationship is self-esteem. And we're going to be focusing in on self-esteem, how, how that develops, where it comes from in, uh, during these uh, tapes. Now, that's the, the healthy um, scenario to the enmeshed, which is we're unlikely to go back in that direction. We're more likely to go from there to there. Most people get into that position the first night they meet somebody at the pub. This is the position of true ram romance, as I said, where people tend to pick up the relationship that was available that night and may indeed stay in it for the next 20 or 30 years. Dreadfully unhappy. Now, we put more planning into, generally, buying a, a new pair of jeans than we do into, specifically, what we might need in a relationship in our culture. We just don't plan for relationships, generally speaking. So we need to start thinking about, well, okay, what is it that we're sort of falling into in a relationship here? We would certainly put more um, effort and thought and planning into buying a house than we do into a relationship. And as I said, it's horrific for me to, to, to recognise that most of us do indeed buy a pair of jeans with more thought and planning about design, size, shape, colour and so on than we would in terms of a relationship, which is uh, disastrous. So, relationship planning is something that we need to, f to think about. But let's have a look at this. We've looked at this adult to adult. The same applies adult to child. This is not about time spent together in hours, minutes, etc. This is not about having, you know, a, a, a small percentage of your time together. This is not about being together 100% of the time. Because, for instance, two adults who live together, are married to, and run a business together, can have this sort of relationship where there are healthy boundaries. And we will be talking a lot about boundaries as we go through these, uh, the four parts of the uh, analysis. Um, where two parties here have healthy boundaries, can be together, run a business together, live together, and still have their individuality, their interests, their activities, and so on. Here, this particular scenario can be done uh, by remote control, where person A, who is doing the trapping, may, may not be on the scene at all, or very rarely, or even dead. And people will still be saying, oh, no, no, I could never do that. Why not? Because mother said so, not, I shouldn't do it. Yes, but she's been dead for 10 years. Oh, yes, but I still wouldn't do it. This is the type of entrapment that we get into. That it, that is the, the brainwashing impact. It works. Now, as I said, this is the same if it's adult child as if it's adult to adult. The healthy parent-child relationship looks like that, not this. The healthy child-parent relationship, even with the newborn, that needs to have somebody there 24 hours a day, doesn't mean absolute control and entrapment. It still means, in healthy parenting, 
Responding to the individual needs and boundaries. Individual needs of the infant, individual needs of the parent. And keeping those needs in focus. So that's the healthy child-parent relationship. This is an enmeshed, smothering type of parenting where the child's overprotected and you can't go out there and you can't do this and you mustn't do that and the world's a terrible place and, and so on. Where the child becomes enmeshed with the parents and here is the position required for child abuse. Children who are being abused must be kept isolated, trapped. They must have uh, brainwashing that changes their reality because children who are being abused cannot go and talk about it at show and tell at school. They can't tell the neighbours. They can't tell their friends. They must be, it must be kept silenced in order for it to be continued. So there must be no escape, no, no light at the end of the tunnel, no alternative view, no special person that you can talk to because if there is, you can find your way out of it. The child who is being abused is trapped and isolated and believes what the abuser tells them. Now, what we need to look at then is what are the characteristics of people who have, are able to have, set up and sustain a healthy relationship? And we will be looking at, as we go through this program, we'll be looking at the nature of self-esteem, the nature of communication, how do you effectively communicate, how do you specifically communicate, how do you get your needs met, so that that scenario can apply. Now relationship planning. We need to think about how do you plan for a relationship, what are the characteristics of a relationship that you need to bring in to this healthy scenario. And as I said, one of the problems is we tend to pick up a relationship because it was available at the pub that night and stay in it. What we need to do is consider the, the, the whole person. This person has a number of needs. We all do. There will be physical needs. There will be sexual needs. There will be psychological needs. And we're talking here about psychological needs, mean, meaning how good do I feel about myself? Am I a worthwhile person? Am I valuable? Do I feel okay? Do I feel that the world welcomes me and values me? We have emotional needs and or romantic needs, love affection needs. We have intellectual needs in terms of our thinking and being challenged intellectually. Uh, we have social needs and how, how do we feel about party, party, party or sitting at home quietly reading a book, going to the footy every week or you know doing some other social activity. We have financial needs and what could be called spiritual, ideological. Now they, they are all the needs that we basically have and you may include some others. I invite the people that I work with to consider carefully on their own as an exercise what do they actually want for themselves in their life, here, in their whole life, physically, and what do they want physically, as a separate exercise, out of a relationship? What do they want sexually, in terms of their whole life, or is specifically in, in a relationship? What do they want to be happening psychologically? For themselves in their whole life but more specifically in the relationship? What do they want emotionally in terms of the relationship and how are they 
to how do they want, need to get their needs met of their whole life emotionally. And similarly, intellectually, socially, financially, spiritually. It's an exercise that I do uh, with most of my clients to give them uh, an experience of actually doing some planning here and finding out why it might be that the relationship that they've been in, if they've come to me with relationship problems, why it might not be working. What percentage of their needs are being met. And it's to my horror that I find that a lot of relationships are operating around the 0 to 25% satisfaction level. Which explains why we've got a lot of relationship problems happening in our culture. Do these sorts of relationships apply in the workplace? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> it is very, very um, worthwhile to do that exercise in terms of the work environment. For instance, it might not seem relevant, say, to have sexual in there, but if you're being sexually harassed in the workplace, it's very relevant in terms of your needs to feel okay sexually. Uh, yes, certainly. It's very uh, relevant to do that sort of exercise uh, in applying to whatever part of your life that you need to get some answers for. If only one person in a relationship is healthy, how do you work it out? That's a communication issue. That uh, amazes me that many um, uh, people in a relationship do not communicate clearly and specifically about what they need. And let me give you an example of this. Women will say to me that, uh, look, I want my husband to talk to me. Uh, I need him to talk to me and he never will. He never talks to me. And I say, well, have you asked him? And she'll say, yes, I ask him all the time. And I say, well, now tell me specifically what you have said to him. And she'll say, well, I say to him, look, uh, you know, once the tea's finished, uh, will you help me with the dishes? Now she thinks she has said to him, um, look, I'm really, I've got lots to tell you about today. I want to hear about your day. I'm feeling quite, you know, uh, interested about what's been happening. I want to swap stories. And uh, I'd really like us to have some time together. I don't really care about the dishes, but let's spend the time together doing it. Now, that's what she thinks she said. But what she said was, I want you to help me with the dishes. Now, he hears, you lazy bastard, you never do anything. So he says, not on your life, I'm going to watch television, I've been working all day. What do you think I am? And she hears him say, I don't want to talk to you. Now, missed communication. In terms of how do you get other people uh, involved in discussion about needs, for instance, where one person's got, you know, a broad, healthy life, the other person's, you know, hanging on, doesn't want to do much. That's a common problem. That is about specific negotiation and working out what is, what are the needs of this person and how do they get them met. That is the, um, the subject of uh, a lot of therapy that is done generally and certainly a subject of a lot of the therapy that I do, particularly with couples. But that is a negotiation process. It's about looking at where this person's self-esteem has arisen from, what do they believe about themselves and the world that they're in, and looking at how encouraging and uh, supporting them without rescuing them, as we'll hear later, uh, to, to start to enrich their own lives. But there, that is a very common problem where one person is fearful when another the other person in the relationship says, oh, look, I think I'll go back to university, you know? Or, you know, I think I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go and join a new club. And the other person gets very fearful. Fear of abandonment is about low self-esteem. And as we will be looking at in the later uh, parts of the uh, program, that low self-esteem is learnt at a very, very early age. So we need to go back and see what are the beliefs around that for each individual. Dawn, do you have to get 100% of your needs met? in the relationship checklist? My belief is, based on the therapy that I do with people and what I have seen, is that it is impossible and you're setting yourself up to fail if you expect to get 100% of your needs met. Um, I 
personally believe that it is a healthy aim to get 80% on all of those. Now, 80% means that you've got 20% error. That means that one day in every five can be completely hopeless. Now, that's a very generous um, room for error, I believe. But it would be um, very self-defeating of us to aim for 100% satisfaction at all times because we will fail. And it is true that nobody in any healthy relationship can give anyone else 100% of their needs. So my definition of a healthy relationship is where both parties get at least 80% on all of those. We d you don't have to be getting 80%, but if there is a willingness from both parties to work towards that 80% satisfaction, that's good enough too, providing there is a willingness to keep moving. Mm -hmm.